All right. You're almost going to. Work. There's been this error like this. Yeah, well, I got it. one in that pocket. You want it? No, the one's in that pocket. I'm hmm? Okay. <clears throat> Welcome, um, all of you, to the uh, Stafford yeah, Hamlet March 8th. Uh, community meeting, uh, CPO, and Somebody board meeting. Uh, tonight's uh, featured uh, guest speaker is Jonathan Hangarten from uh, Clackamas County's Transportation Department. He's been with us on numerous occasions in the past, and yet he still comes back, uh, which we appreciate and look forward to uh, him updating us on the Stafford Road project, um, mostly that occurs around Johnson and uh, Childs. So Jonathan, um, enlighten us. Sure. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for the invite from the Stafford Hamlet. Uh, as Bill mentioned, we've had a couple of these meetings where I presented and this, this Stafford Road Improvement Project is already a year or so in the making. So I just wanted to give kind of a brief update. And then I believe this quick presentation will be posted online for reference. And we'll also have a short time of questions at the end as well. So let me see, am I able to share my screen? Yes, you should be. Okay. I should have figured this out a moment ago, but let's see, where would that be? Um, on the lower um, bot portion of your screen, there's a green button that says, says share screen. All right, can you see that? Yeah, perfect. All right. So like I mentioned, this is uh, the Stafford Road Improvement Project, which is a project on a county road and it's funded by county funds. Um, and just briefly an update um, since the last time we met, I think we had a presentation last summer. Since then, uh, the second half of last year, we had a virtual open house and we also sent out some postcards to nearby residents. So hopefully everyone had a chance to go online to that open house and look at more details of the project and provide some feedback as well. Um, we got really good participation with that online open house and we got a lot of comments and feedback from the public. So appreciate that. Um, in January of this year, the design consultant completed their 60% design of the project. And a big piece of that was informed by those comments that we got from that virtual open house. And I'll get into more of the details of how those comments impacted the project a little bit later. Um, this summer, we'll be kind of finalizing what the design footprint looks like and how that might impact adjacent properties. Um, so we'll be reaching out to property owners this summer. And as always, we're really working hard to minimize any impacts to the properties along this project. Um, in addition to the work this summer, we're continuing through the design process and continuing to refine that. And that'll continue all the way through 2023. So this year and next we'll be doing design work. Um, and construction is scheduled to start in 2024 and will likely take two full calendar years. Um, a lot of that has to do with the extensive utility relocations that will be required and then just the scope of the work for the road work. And I think possibly the last presentation or the one before, we had said tentatively we might be constructing in 2023. Um, we are scheduling that for 2024 construction now. Um, part of that is because of 
the roundabout that we're going to construct a child and the complexity of that and the extra cost required to do that roundabout option. <clears throat> so just to uh, review the funding for this project, there's two funding sources. One is transportation system development charges, which are fees that the county collects from developers. And that makes up about four and a half million dollars, 4.4. And then the second funding source is community road fund. And that makes up the majority of the funding at about 8.2 million. Um, we're, the county is really excited about this community road fund. It comes from the vehicle registration fee that if you live in Clackamas County, you may have noticed when you registered your vehicle, um, that's given us the ability to do this project because without that funding, this project just wouldn't be possible. So just to review kind of what we're doing with this project, and I'll try to highlight the decisions we've made that were informed by the open house comments and other comments we received from the public. So at the child's intersection, we've decided to construct a roundabout. And you may recall last year, we were at earlier stages of design, looking at different design options at this intersection. And the three major options we looked at was a traffic signal and two different alignments for a roundabout. This, um, this configuration that you can see on this slide, <clears throat> it's roughly on the same alignment as the existing intersection. And we're kind of just building out from what's already there. A couple other things you'll notice. Um, in the Southwest corner, you can see a dark black line and that is a pretty large retaining wall that we're gonna construct. <clears throat> and that's so that we minimize impacts to Pecan Creek and also minimize impacts to the Metro owned property in that corner. Something else you'll notice is that this is a single lane roundabout, but it has some dedicated slip turn lanes. So if you think about coming down the hill on Stafford Road and you wanna take a right onto Childs, you have your own lane to do that. There's kind of a dual lane. You can either take a right on a child or you can go straight through the roundabout. And similarly, if you're on child's road and you're driving towards Stafford and you wanna make a right turn, you have your own dedicated lane to make that right turn. <coughs> Excuse me. So even though it's a single lane roundabout, um, it has these extra turn lanes for those, uh, those busy turn movements. Moving on to the Stafford and Johnson intersection, just down the hill from Childs, the two different options we looked at was this alignment where we eliminate that extreme skew of the intersection and that very steep grade as you come down the hill. And we're accomplishing that through reversing curves. So you have a curve in the road and then another curve. And that gets rid of that skew in the road. That will be very helpful when we think about someone stopped at Johnson wanting to make a turn onto Stafford. And in the configuration that's out there right now, it's very hard to see vehicles that are coming up the road on Stafford. And part of that's because you have to turn your head more than uh, 90 degrees. So eliminating that skew will help with the sight distance and adding those reversing curves will also help reduce the steepness of the grade as you come down Johnson Road. Another thing we're gonna do at Johnson you'll see in this image here, there's a stop sign with a left turn prohibited sign. So we are proposing eliminating left turns onto Stafford from Johnson. And that's something that we've talked to the community about and we got input on the open house. The reason that we want to do that is to reduce uh, what we call shooting the gap where <clears throat> someone sees a really small break in traffic and then guns it and makes 
what might be an unsafe turn. And as we know, Stafford Road is very busy, especially during the morning and the evening um, commute times. So eliminating that left turn lane will be a big safety improvement. <clears throat> Another thing it will do is it will help keep cars from backing up on Johnson Road. The only, and I'll say the only reason we're able to um, eliminate that left turn movement is because we're installing a roundabout at Child Road. So that roundabout at Child Road will allow people to take a right turn, just go right up the street and turn around at the roundabout. And, you know, I will acknowledge that is some out of direction travel. So it will be some, it will take some extra time for people on Johnson Road, but overall it'll be a big safety improvement. Also at Johnson, you'll see we're putting in a dedicated southbound left turn lane onto Johnson. The purpose of that is to keep vehicles moving on Stafford Road. So if cars are sitting there waiting to take a left turn onto Johnson, the cars on Stafford could keep driving down towards 205 and they won't get as backed up. It also should be a safety improvement to help reduce rear end crashes for that same reason. So I've talked about the Childs Road intersection where we're gonna construct a roundabout and the Johnson Road, we're gonna to try to realign it to get rid of that skew and make the grade not so steep coming down the hill. Now, in addition to those two intersections, we're also looking at a really large or a long stretch of Stafford Road where we're gonna add bike lanes to both sides of the road. And the limits of this project, it's gonna go from just north of the Tualatin River Bridge all the way up to the Rosemont Roundabout. Now, uh, the paved bike lanes will be six feet wide and there'll be a bike lane on both sides of Stafford Road. Um, early on in the design process, and I think we probably mentioned this the last presentation, <clears throat> we were looking at how best to do that street widening. And if you've ever driven out on Stafford Road, you know that it's very steep on both sides. So what the design engineers have come up with is to do the majority of the street widening on the east side of the road. So that'd be the uphill side of Stafford Road. And that will require a cut in the slope. And the reason we're widening on that side is because if you were to widen on the downhill side, you would end up filling in the concrete or have to build very expensive retaining walls on the whole project. So the approach we're taking is to widen on the east side, cut into the slope, um, and minimize impacts to the creek and save a tremendous amount of money from retaining walls. That's in the stretch of Stafford Road from the Tualatin River Bridge to Childs Road. Once you get from Childs Road up to the Rosemont Roundabout, we'll do more of a symmetrical widening because the grades aren't so extreme. Um, in addition to this widening, we are going to smooth out those curves as you're driving up the road by paving it and getting more consistent cross slopes <clears throat> and super elevations that meet actual standards because the existing conditions out there don't meet standards. So we are going to make a smoother ride and a safer ride through paving. <clears throat> um, in terms of community outreach, here's a list of some ways you can find out about the project as we move along. There's a project webpage. And if you Google um, Clackamas County Road Projects, you should be able to find that webpage fairly easily. Also, like we're doing here, we try to give updates to the COP and Hamlet and present at meetings occasionally. Um, Ellen and Cameron from Clackamas County, they do some updates on social media that you should be able to follow. 
And on our project webpage, you can sign up for an email list. We also send out postcards to residents that live close to this project. Um, we've had one virtual open house. We will likely update the virtual open house and send out another round of postcards. Um, and then the county and the consultants working for the county will be in contact with property owners as needed. Um, just a couple other highlights about this project. Another thing we've done, and I already kind of mentioned this, we have done everything we can to minimize impacts to pecan creek through the way we've designed the new culvert at child's road by placing a retaining wall at child's road and through some stream restoration that we'll do for pecan creek after installing the roundabout secondly uh, we've incorporated the driveway that is going to be going in for the new uh, Stevens Farmstead Park, which is just west of the Stafford Childs intersection. Third, we have considered future developments in our traffic analysis, and we've incorporated that into our roundabout design. We got a lot of feedback about that, um, and that was helpful to make sure we're sizing this appropriately for future demand. And number four, we are still looking at construction staging for this project. And we are working to balance the safety of travelers on the roadway, the length of the construction, the accessibility to properties and the intersections that are really important. And looking at the feasibility of constructing this under traffic. So with that, um, there's a link to the project webpage and my contact information is there as well. I think I could open it up to some questions if we have time for that. Uh, let's see. Um, Andy Munson, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I got a question. Um, I noticed recently that they moved the stop sign over there on Johnson where it meets Stafford. They put it way to the left um, and about a week later it got plowed and then they put it back up in the same spot <laughs> with the red stripe on it. Um, so I was wondering, is that part of this process? Um, is there a reason that it got moved kind of out in the middle of the road? You know, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I don't believe the capital project group was responsible for that, but I'm sure there was a good reason for it. It could be that our maintenance department got a complaint about something and so they were trying to fix another issue. If you shoot me an email, um, I can try to follow up on that. Cool, yeah, I'll shoot you an email. Um, and then I guess as far as the no left turns go, is that like is that happening or has there been any kind of i don't know maybe some kind of poll where it's like how many people are going to take a right and how many people are just going to disregard that sign and take a left so nothing is set in stone until it's constructed but um <laughs> literally <laughs> yeah but we have looked at different factors and considered the implications and impact of it. And so that is definitely what we're leaning towards. Speaking to the left turns, even if there's a sign, our design has a small um, center island, I guess you could call it, that will be quite a deterrent to left turns, which is just like a standard curb, six inches high. And it comes out just past where you could comfortably turn. If that makes sense. And it'd be in the center of uh, Stafford Road. God, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Hey, Bill Long, you have your hand raised. Need to unmute. Any chance of making a left hand turn? for say three cars on the Mossy Bray Road. 
Now, what I experience is, is a backup like we're looking on the screen uh, when I'm taking a left turn lane off of the Sipley Bridge. And people will either back up or they'll go into the bike lane to get around me. And I'm just waiting with traffic increasing for a couple of rear enders. Thanks for the question, Bill. I don't know if you and I spoke already about this or if you shot me an email and I apologize if I didn't follow up. I actually talked to the design engineer about this and I asked them, hey, one of the property owners that lives here would like to see a left turn lane. Is that something we could do as kind of a low cost improvement since we're already gonna be out here? even though it's not part of the original scope of the project. And we looked at the width of the pavement that's out there and it's not, unfortunately, it's not wide enough to just restrike for one. So at this time we haven't pursued widening additional asphalt width to accomplish that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Rick Cook. Um, yeah, hey, John, just along that line, and then this kind of folds into my questions is, is there a chance for any of the tolling diversion money to be used in any of the improvements along this? So working with ODOT on that, which might be able to say, hey, we're going to get all this diversion here. So maybe they could, uh, they could uh, uh, fund that widening of that portion down there. And then a second question you, um, in that, I think it was the number three thing we're talking about Lake Oswego development. Um, is that a traffic study the county's going to do? Is that something? How are you going to look at that? Because I have my doubts about some of the things that are coming from their traffic study with the projects they're doing. Sure. So um, the consultant traffic engineer that the county's hired as part of this project has a model for the Child Road intersection, Johnson pretty much all of Stafford from 205 up to Rosemont. And how they captured that new improvement that's planned is they just took the number of new daily trips <clears throat> for each improvement and they put them into their model. And the configuration that we have shown now will accommodate those extra trips. I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> um, so I guess just to clarify, so does that like for the receipt property that's on the northwest corner of the Stafford Rosemont roundabout, they're putting in athletic fields, a large playground, and now they've added a skate park. So are mm -hmm. those elements all taken into that traffic study? I believe so. Um, the okay. email that you sent, I have I forwarded that to our design engineer. Okay. And they've looked into each of those developments and put it into the modeling. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I guess the other only question was uh, about any of the tolling funds for diversion. We will be able to dip into any of that with the, the county. That's a great question. Uh, that's not something we've pursued this far. It's something we could look at. I would imagine there's quite a few people uh, vying for that. Well, they, they said at the last ODOT meeting that there was eight different intersections along Stafford, both on the south side of the freeway and the north side, all the way up to McVeigh, that they're looking out to fund some improvement. So I'm just thinking if we can, you know, get more bang for our buck by using some of theirs money, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. That's a great thought. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. Attendees, do you have any questions for Jonathan? Oh, Randy. Uh, Katie, uh, uh, John McCabe had some uh, uh, chat questions. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you're right, thank you. Maybe, maybe he can. I don't know if he can talk on this thing, but. Yeah, 
So John's question was, what is the increased traffic on Stafford with the tolling on I-205? Uh, I got the same answer I do for Rick. I actually can't answer that off the top of my head. And I'll follow up and see if I can find more detailed information about that. I'm sure it'll be significant. <laughs> Looks like. Oh, well, if there, if, oh, if, if, if there isn't any other, if there aren't any other questions, um, I, actually, I think, excuse John me? does have a hand raised. Oh, go ahead, sure. John. Okay, uh, my, my other question was with the no left turn on Johnson. Um, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to do a 360 at the roundabout, and how many do you guys think that's going to be? It's, it's in the traffic study that we've conducted. And so that has been accounted for. Is that published okay. already, Jonathan? Uh, it's a pretty large document, but if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to track down the particular sheet or two, you know, that addresses that issue. That's no problem at all. Um. Mitch, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Katie. I, I just kind of pinging off some other people's talk, but is there anything on the diversion study that the ODOT was supposed to do? We talked to them a couple of months ago. They hadn't even done a study. Actually, I find it pretty appalling. Um, does Jonathan or anybody seen the study to see if it's how legitimate it is? Um, because it's going to be the tolling diversion is going to be very significant, um, not just on. on um, Stafford, but on Eck Road and um, Willamette Falls, et cetera. Do we, we have, has ODA actually done what they said they would do? I think they said it would have it in February, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, thank you for that question. It sounds like I need to track that down. I would imagine someone at the county may have received it. I haven't looked at it yet, but I'll look into it and see what I can figure out. Can, can we get a copy so we can try to legitimize whether it's actually, you know, fair assumptions in our, in our viewing way, our layman's view, but. Uh, if you guys wanted to post it on your web website there, you certainly could. Okay. At the last ODOT meeting, they said that it wasn't finished yet. But they said they would have, I thought they said they'd have it like around February or something like that. If I'm not mistaken. Well, February's come and gone. So maybe I'm mistaken on the date, but it was pretty imminent. We do have one attendee, Don Young, who has his hand raised. So I'm gonna allow Don to ask his question. Don, if you could unmute yourself. I just did. Oh, perfect. Uh, I have concerns and I live off Rosemont. We're in, we're being paid, made to pay the penalty for the tolling, which is gonna clog up every road going north, south, east and west. It's already bad. And, and all this planning is just making it easier for those people, but it doesn't solve the real problem, which is uh, the tolling down on the freeway. Maybe the, the width of the freeway is important, but I, I think we missed the point in a lot of areas here. I don't know how much I can speak to that directly since that's it. ODOT driven project, I imagine the county will become a lot more involved as we have more information to look at. But I think it's a really good point you raise that that's a factor we should consider as that's kind of a new thing that's come along, you know, in the middle of this project. Are there any more questions? I see Don, your hand is still raised. Would you, you have another question or Mitch? No, I, 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 I've heard his response. It, this is a much larger problem than this, this situation is trying to solve. Uh, mm -hmm. You're trying to move uh, all the people in the Ukraine north on one road. And that's what's not gonna work very well. Uh, but I'll keep the, the politics out of this, thanks. <laughs> Thanks for your question, Don. Okay, um, Jonathan, as always, thanks. Um, thanks for, for your thorough and, um, and compressed presentation. It's nice to see that 
that the design has um, bike lanes, um, which I mean, it's amazing that there aren't a lot of run over bicyclists on, on uh, Stafford Road, given all the bicycle use that that gets and, and how, how narrow the road is. So that's, that in and of itself is gonna be a, a major improvement in my opinion. And, and it really sounds like you've thought a lot of things through well. So um, thank you, thanks for doing that. And I have no doubt that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you again as, uh, as we start to close in on, uh, on, on 2024. So, uh, I think what we have up next is um, the Mark Brown Rick Cook show, um, Heritage in the Hamlet. And uh, I don't know if Rick's going to go first tonight or Mark is, but we'll let them sort that out and, um, and entertain us with some uh, interesting facts. Well, actually, I am going to step back and let. Um, one of our guest speakers uh, take control of it and uh, work with uh, Mark tonight. So Katie Kreiner, our new historian in the area. <laughs> um, well, I will tee it up by saying the last couple of weeks have been really interesting in my family. Um, I've spent um, a long weekend with my parents helping go through their belongings and pack their house up um, for a transition in their life. Um, and just a little bit of background. I grew up in Lake Oswego right off McBay on a little street called Horseshoe Curve. Um, lived in that house since from 1968 until I'm, we moved up um, to near Lake Ridge High School um, when I was 17. Anyway, as my mom and I were going through miscellaneous junk drawers and boxes, we came across these two amazing um, artifacts. And from there, I will share my screen and share that with you. Okay, and it's not working for me. <laughs> Hold on. Jump in at any time, there we go. Are you guys seeing? Whoa, hold on. Are you seeing that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so the two items that we found were um, two pieces of obsidian glass um, that initially, I remember as a child kind of running across in my parents' house, kind of wondering what those were. And um, I picked them up and I said, mom, look at these. And she's like, oh yeah, I found those back in, you know, 19, 68, 70, um, when I was out gardening in the backyard. And I'm like, well, you know, they really do look like, you know, potentially important artifacts. And um, so I, and so this first piece was this beautiful kind of elongated piece of obsidian with very, very sharp edges. Um, and I, I mean, they just naturally looked like they, were ancient artifacts. Um, and the second piece was this round um, piece of obsidian, which had kind of a natural place for your thumb, um, just these beautiful tools. Um, and so I immediately jumped on Google and you know searched for obsidian, Lake Oswego, um, you know, tribal artifacts. And um, what I found was, which I knew nothing about and I grew up in this community, my, you know, spent my whole life here, um, was the history of the Burnett site, um, which is lo located um, in Old Town Lake Oswego off of Furnace and Church Street. Um, and that was just about a mile from my house on Horseshoe Curve. Um, and digging into some of the documents about the Burnett site, which are very well documented, um, through the Oregon Historical Society, Portland State University, as well as um, just the city of Lake Oswego in general, um, gave me a plethora of information and I was just awestruck and, and taken in by it. Um, and, you know, very, very curious to learn more. Um, th this is a photograph from um, the Burnett site. Um, this is a 
an item that was found, all of these are very similar to the one piece of obsidian um, that I found, um, or that my mom found, I should say, um, in our backyard. Um, it's called the cascade style lanceolate projectile point. Um, and these were recovered during the original excavation at the Burnett site in uh, 1987. Uh, this is some text um, from the Oregon Encyclopedia through the Oregon Historical Society. And I just want to read a little bit of this. Um, the Burnett site, located on a terrace above the Willamette River in a private residential neighborhood within the city of Lake Oswego, is one of the oldest archaeological sites in the Pacific Northwest. So I didn't know this, and my, my jaw just dropped. Uh, dating back to the transition from the late Pleistocene to the early Holocene, over 7,000 prehistoric artifacts were recovered and analyzed from the site, including, including various stone tools and debris from the making of stone tools and weapons. Um, it says here, the site served as a seasonal hunting camp that was likely occupied and reused over a period of roughly 11,500 years. Hunting equipment armed with stone projectile points was manufactured, used, resharpened, and eventually discarded at the site. Tools used for butchering and processing game animals suggest that the occupants of the site lived at the location for brief periods of time to perform tasks associated with hunting and hide processing. Um, this also fascinating, the Burnett site um, located, located between the traditional territories of the Clackamas Chinook and the Tualatin Band of the Kalapoya um, both groups seasonally migrated to the lake to gather roots, to fish, and to hunt waterfowl. And they traveled to nearby Willamette Falls for salmon. Um, another thing I learned, well, the, the site and all of the artifacts were so well documented, and there is a paper that you can easily find online, or I can send it to you if you're interested. Um, but what I learned is only 2% of the artifacts that were found at the Burnett site were made of obsidian. Um, and it tells why that was here. It says obsidian and natural volcanic glass shaped into tools by early occupants of the Burnett site can also be dated using a technique called obsidian hydration, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it said the geochemistry of the obsidian artifacts indicates that obsidian was imported from Southeast Oregon as far as 200 miles from the Burnett site. Um, so that suggests that it was traded or it was brought, you know, obviously brought to the site around Lake Oswego, the Burnett site, and possibly my backyard. <laughs> so cool. So um, having this amazing experience um, with um, Dr. Uh, Mark Brown joining us for our Hamlet Heritage every month, I knew exactly who to call. Um, so I called Mark and told him what I found. He was very interested and I sent the pictures that I had taken of it. Um, and uh, we met just a couple days ago and I um, gave them to him. And he is, um, has been in contact with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. Um, they have a um, cultural center. Um, and they also have an um, archeologist on, on staff. And they just told us today that they're very interested in the two um, objects or artifacts and we'll be bringing them to um, the Ch Ch Chalu Cultural Center um, in Grand Ronde um, to be part of their collection. And we also hope that they're gonna do some scientific kind of um, research on them to see if they can be dated, et cetera, and to see if they are authentic. Um, so fingers crossed, I, it's just been really an interesting journey for me and learning about the city that I grew up in, just aspects of it that I wasn't aware of. And my whole family's just excited about being part of that. So also, as we do every month, we have our um, bottle of wine giveaway from Eugene Wine Cellars. And I put together some, some uh, uh, questions um, from the presentation. Um, so if you guys can answer these, please put it in the chat um, box. So the first question was, when was the Burnett site first discovered and excavated? A, 1968. 
B, 1967, C, 1987, or D, 1986? Give you guys a minute to <laughs> type that in. Um, number two, how many artifacts were found at the site? Over 700, over 7,000, over 1,700, or over 2,000? Then I have two more questions, all for a bottle of wine from the Eugene Wine Cellars, um, which Rick Cook will have for you. Um, number three, which tribes hunted at Lake Waluga, which is now called Lake Oswego? A, the Grand Ronde, B, the Clackamas Chinook, C, Tualatin Kalapoya, or D, Klawalwala? And then the last question is, how long was the site thought to be inhabited? A, 1,150 years, B, 11,500 years, C, 1,700 years, or D, 10,000 years? And now I'll have to look in the chat. Okay, I'll have to get back to you guys. <laughs> anyway, that was my presentation and I'm wondering if Mark or Rick, you have anything to share. By our way, Dr. Brown. Yeah, we uh, at the Heritage House, we get something like this about every two years um, and I just absolutely love it. Uh, our lane is not this particular uh, archeological stuff. I always get, get what we get like from, from Katie and then I send it to Dr. Beckham uh, Stephen Beckham, uh, and he analyzes it for me and tells me whether or not we're in the ballpark of something interesting. Half of the time, he will send whatever I send to him, uh, like this scraper, for example, on the screen, um, and he'll send it all over the country to get, get opinions about it. This came back really pretty quick, and uh, I contacted uh, uh, the Grand Ron and, and got it started. Paperwork came in today. This is the fastest I've ever seen them turn around. Uh, either they have nothing to do or they're really interested in these particular artifacts. Uh, so, but anyway, we'll probably get the paperwork done uh, this week and uh, get it shipped off to them. They'll tell me the methodology of shipment and packing and that sort of thing. Once in a great while, they'll come pick them up themselves, which I doubt would be the case with this. But uh, if you have these things, what, the nice thing about this particular find is that the provenance uh, is well established uh, and you can always over um, get enthusiastic about what these particular finds are. Um, you know, how do they get there and that sort of thing. So you can over speculate, but if these indeed are in uh, site to uh, artifacts, then this may have been an indication of a, a campsite. So, but we'll see, I'll probably go over to the uh, neighborhood and climb over the fence and start digging and see what they have to say about it. And I, my last thing would be just that if anybody has a family story or comes across things like that, this is what has been so marvelous. Katie called and said this. I was just floored and said, well, how great it was because Mark and I were kind of, well, what are we going to do this month? And all of a sudden, Katie came and said, boy, I found this really cool stuff and I'd love to share it. So uh, Mark did all the, the legwork as usual. And uh, so if you have any any family stories, pictures, any of that, get a hold of myself or Dr. Brown there at the Heritage House. and. Uh, you can do next month's presentation. <laughs> and don't, don't be afraid about artifacts that you may have uh, that that's, people will bother you for them. This is sort of a uh, low level stuff. You're not gonna have feds knocking on your door and wanting to dig <laughs> up your backyard. That will not happen. But if, if you do have this stuff, I, I would suggest you do what Katie did, uh, have it analyzed and then get it back, back to where it belongs. There's three, uh, federal statutes from 1906 to 1979 that sort of mandate what large institutions do. Micro museums like the one that I'm in and, and uh, uh, private owners really don't have anything to worry about. So uh, if you have it, uh, don't throw them away, don't clean them, and either send them to the Grand Ron yourself. Don't just put them in a box and mail them. Uh, contact them first and then have it screened. 
uh, they literally have warehouses full of projectile points and scrapers, so they may or may not want it. So uh, just just do that. If if you have that stuff, uh, go ahead and and um, go through the the minor inconvenience of, of preserving them. As always, thank you, Mark. Great job, uh, great job, Katie. Uh, I may just back out and give you this to you next month too. Oh no. <laughs> I do have to say that we have a winner though. Mitch Jones wins the bottle of wine. He got all four questions correct. So. So Rick, that makes two for me. I there you go. I'll, I'll, I'll deliver your second bottle to your pickup point. <laughs> I can go by your place. If you... no, but... It's actually, I think your first bottle's down at the Fiala Farmstead. Oh, thanks, is it really? Sarah, yeah. Thanks very much, Katie. That was well done and, and absolutely inter very interesting. And and uh, and it's, it's local, about as local as you can get. So good for you. And, and thanks for your help, Mark. You bet. Uh, there is, or I think it was last weekend, the Oregonian ran a piece on, uh, I, guess, I think it's Chachalu, the the Grand Ronde, the uh, Confederated Tribes, the Grand Ronde's Cultural Museum um, in Grand Ronde, and it was pretty interesting because it's a it's it's a rather unique setup for um, for a cultural museum. They they've done some pretty pretty unique things, but uh, when you say that, it's nice that that you hooked up with them and and gave it a home. So. Uh, I think we're, uh, we've got Andy Munson up here for, um, actually for, for two items. I don't know, you know, Andy's um, got, got um, limited verbal skills, but I'm sure he can handle two of these. Um, so one has the fir and cedar saplings that he's put together. And the other is uh, just a brief update on the map, uh, the mapping of the ham for the Hamlet residents uh, by neighborhood. Uh, we're gonna talk more about that in the board meeting, but I thought as long as we had uh, as many citizens involved here as we do, we could uh, we could maybe take advantage of that. Um, so Andy. I got my I got my samples here to show you. <laughs> um, after the big storm that we had last year, um, it's been on my mind getting things replanted. So I reached out to some different folks and uh, Glenn Aherns, who is the extension forestry officer for our area, um, took the bait. So he, uh, he's, he's interested in helping us out if you wanna replant your property. Um, his approach is very much, I think a, a forestry approach of coming in and doing a lot of clearing and then planting tons of trees. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's going to be the approach that all of our residents in the Hamlet want to go about. Um, but he had some great tips. Um, so I'll share with you the, this one right here is a Doug fir. Uh, this is a cedar sapling and um, we're going to be selling these for a buck a piece. And the idea is that you can take them out, um, scrape an area, clear it and plant. And um, we're gonna put together a video on how to do that properly. Um, some of the big stuff that we took away from him coming out and demonstrating was maintenance of the area um, after you have them planted, um, clearing of the area uh, before you have them planted and um, kind of a, a tremendous amount of work if you really want them to be successful. Um, so I, we're gonna to put together a video. I don't wanna dissuade people from planting trees. Um, so yeah, come by Fourth Quarter Farm, which is my mom's farm right down the hill from my place. Um, in the chat over here, I'll put her address. I'm gonna go put 20 of these in her small cooler at the bottom of the driveway tomorrow morning. Um, and so if people wanna swing by and grab them, grab them. And then if you want more than 20 um, or whatever's in the cooler at the time, I'll also put my email down here in the chat box. And um, you can shoot me an email, just put in the subject line trees and your name. And uh, we'll start figuring out a good distribution way. Um, the last bit I think I have on that is that uh, now's the time. So you've got between now and 
probably end of March, maybe early April for these things to get rained in. Um, if you don't get them in the ground, you're going to need to be watering them. And then the next best time is going to be this fall. So if you miss the window, you didn't really miss it. Spend the time uh, getting your area prepped, make spots clear to brush and debris and blackberries and, and get them rolling. So um, that's my tree talk. Is that, am I within time? All right. How many, how many trees do you have, Andy? Uh, we've got a hundred cedars and 50 Doug firs. And this is kind of the, originally I just thought, oh, we'll plant those on my property. Um, and then I found out like how much work it's going to be to clear all the areas and make them really successful. Um, so we're going to open these up for residents of the hamlet that want to come get them. And, um, and then, yeah, we'll be ordering more. Uh, so if this has a lot of interest, I'll put in a big order through Glenn and do a pickup. Okay, so do you want to yeah. give, a, give a summation of, of where you are with the map so people can kind of have this on their radar that it's coming? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open up a screen share here. This is my first time doing this. So bear with me. Hey, Bill, question. Uh, I, I audio only, but a question as far as will, will we be able to have a link on the website for these trees? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna work on a video um, that'll that'll just talk about planting, um, and then as far as ordering goes, we don't have a digital format to take payment right now. Um, but this being phase one, I think we might get the kinks worked out by fall, um, and then especially next year to be getting just tons of trees in the ground out here. I think it's something everybody I've talked to is excited about it. Um, something things you know people can do with their kids. Um, so yeah, we'll have that going. Let me hit screen share here. Okay. All right, y'all able to see this? Um, okay, so this is a sample of what the map's gonna look like. This is an editable version. Um, you can see as I zoom out, 205 down here, this map specifically is primarily the Sweetbriar area, um, but we can use my property here. Once you select that, you can see down here uh, my address, which will be pulled from tax records, and my name, number, and email. Um, my number and email, that'll be just voluntary information. So any residents that don't want to jump on board with this, that's all right. Um, Anybody that uh, does want to provide it, we're going to work through kind of a terrace of who will have um, access to this information. So um, right now, you can see as I zoom out, this would be considered a neighborhood that will have each other's contact information. Um, and so something like Ashdown Woods over here, you can see is not in this neighborhood. Um, so if people have privacy issues, we're not going to shotgun information out. Um, everything's going to be password protected. Um, everything will be read only um, to the residents. And then as we have neighborhood captains get on board, they'll be able to edit the map. Um, but the primary idea is that people can jump on this, um, quickly contact somebody in the event of an emergency, in the event of seeing suspicious behavior, um, in the event of a wildfire, in the event of ice storms, you can identify, hey, here's somebody that might need some help clearing their driveway. Um, so my hope is that it connects the community out here and uh, gets people looking out for each other. Oh, you're muted. <clears throat> yeah. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm on both both levels, both the trees and the and the mapping. Um, really, really going to benefit the community as we as we move further along. And uh, and Andy will figure out um, some method of you know whether it's a. We, we don't have we don't think a swear anymore. We had one for for the fest, but we'll figure out a way to that you can get money to us. I mean, um, we certainly aren't going to. We aren't, we aren't going to make it hard on you. 
Yeah. Uh, I want to recognize uh, a few folks that are that are here tonight. Um, from the transportation department, um, Cameron Ruin and Ellen Roglin. Ellen's been with us on a number of occasions along with Jonathan. Um, wanted to thank them for, for coming and, and um, being involved. Uh, commissioners Sonia Fisher and Mark Scholl are, are both with us. Um, thank you for, for coming and, uh, and sharing in our evening. Uh, Katie Wilson, um, who used to do what Katie Kreider does, which was host our Zoom meetings, um, she's sitting in. Thank you for that. And I think Jeff Goodman, um, past uh, Lake Oswego City Councilman, um, it was also, I think I saw his name. And besides all those, um, either um, staff or, um, or dignitaries, We've got uh, Carol Yamada, whose um, who's lovely husband, um, Randy, is our CPO chair. Uh, and I didn't know if Carol had any um, further information on the signage that um, is going to go up at Lesher and when, when she might have the, um, the groundbreaking of that. So, Carol? Can Carol unmute herself? Carol is here. I don't see her on the attendee list. Uh, no. well, anyway, that's that's fine. Randy, tell tell your wife that she was recognized and appreciated. Um, so mm -hmm. thanks, thanks to all of you for for coming and um, and and being a part of this. And actually, now it's um, it's the Randy Yamada um, and the CPO show with uh, with the rest of his board. So, uh, Randy, you want to want to take us over and, and run through what you got going on? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, Rick is is going to do a uh, rundown of the. Rasik Park project. He's doing a great job of um, coaching a, a whole bunch of very different people and with different and uh, opposing uh, uh, views on the park into uh, creating a park that hopefully we can all enjoy. So, Rick. Yeah, um, Katie, if you could bring up that first uh, slide presentation. There's only four slides on it. It's about what the park currently looks like design-wise for the play area. Um, should be, yeah. I'm not sure if you're gonna blow that up any. Anyway, uh, meeting on uh, Monday night, and basically, I know it's kind of hard to see, but so, and I can't move my screen around. But anyway, so the upper right-hand corner is where the skate park's going to go in. Uh, that light area to the top of that is the maintenance road, which used to be the driveway to the star property that went all the way up the hill. Um, the circles, the red circles are picnic tables. Um, and the field layout is pretty much uh, two soccer or right, one soccer field, a lacrosse field and uh, two softball diamonds. Uh, they're youth softball and well, they're youth baseball. So it's not a regulation baseball fields, but just a, a youth uh, baseball and then the uh, or, and softball fields. So uh, you can see where the parking lot is, the entrance. And I think there's another picture that. So here are some of the elements. If you go to that second uh, picture. Um, this is up to the northwest corner. Uh, the church is just to the net, the where it says that Stephen Tuttle, just to that side up there. So this is that the playground area that they've expanded. Um, the blue area is a synthetic type of soft uh, wheelchair accessible um, um, flooring, for lack of better call it. And uh, as we go through, you know, there's be a couple other pictures to the right of that. You see the uh, uh, three uh, picnic benches there, but that's going to be the uh, 
covered shelter that they've actually expanded. They listened to the Palisades Neighborhood Association and uh, they moved the bathrooms uh, to, the, to the right a little bit further. And then once again, the, the skate park is way off off the picture on the right there. So there's about three or four different areas for the playground. You see the green area, uh, that's a swing, a bucket swing, I guess. And some, uh, I don't know if that's gonna be synthetic grass or what they're doing there. And then the, the just south of that is, is they're gonna have logs and rocks and things to cause. So they've done a fairly good job of listening to the, the uh, community about what they wanted to put in there. So you can go to the next slide. And then <clears throat> this would be just, uh, backed off looking from the south up to the north where that picture was just there. So the upper right hand corner, there is the, the picnic structure. They're gonna have a climbing element and a slide. Uh, that's the big tall uh, things that's netted in so kids can get up there and climb and then slide down the slide. They have um, all along the wall there um, from right to just to the, where the uh, picnic shelter is. And then if you follow that path down, that's gonna be um, increasingly more difficult climbing rocks. And the first one is just gonna be a, uh, pretty much paved and then it goes into stairs and then it goes into smaller rocks and then big rocks. And then there's another slide there. So that's uh, the picture of kind of, just kind of give you an idea of what they're thinking, trying to keep it very natural um, and so forth. And the next slide, um, this kind of gives you a, a better idea where that's all gonna go in. So you can see in relationship to the athletic fields, um, to the bottom left-hand corner, that gray area, this kind of horseshoe, that's the um, driveway where it's in the drop-off area. Uh, bathrooms are up to the top. There's a maintenance shed up to the right-hand side. And uh, so that's kind of uh, the current layout. <clears throat> At the meeting, they didn't talk about um, a lot of the things we wanted to talk to about uh, with the um, addition of the skate park. They're going to have to add some parking. They didn't have a number. They haven't uh, redone the uh, traffic study yet. They are actually are supposedly looking hard at all of the projects combined uh, between the aquatic center, the park, uh, their parks and rec complex, the offices, the golf course repair or uh, redesign, and the receipt property. Um, so that study is not done yet. They're also gonna have a uh, study funded by the ARPA dollars, which is the American Rescue, whatever, I can't remember that. Anyway, from they're gonna study from the roundabout down to McVeigh and um, 43 for down the road when they need to improve things. So there's still work, a lot of things that are, well, we're not done with that yet. We're not done with that yet. And then Katie, if you can go to that, the last, uh, uh, Picture I said, it'll give you a timetable of what they have planned, um, how the park's gonna, I guess, basically the next timetable. Um, just got this from uh, Chris Durkee of the Palisades Neighborhood Association. And just so you know, that, um, like I said, we had a meeting on Monday night. Um, so the project team is supposedly going to be submitting a, their final land use piece in the next two weeks. Um, the city gets it. Um, they have 120 days to look at it and see if it's complete. They've, it's, they've uh, put it in once and it was incomplete or marked incomplete, threw it back out to them. So they're resubmitting it. Um, then it goes back into um, the planning staff and then it goes to the Development uh, Review Commission and they'll look at it. And um, if they approve it, then it goes to the project team and they put it out, well, there's a thing about, there's a, a no bill thing, but actually a contract bill thing, that was for the, the skate park. So it uh, goes a bit. And then during supposedly all of these things, you'll have time to take, um, or they will take your public um, input. So if you have any uh, concerns or things, and you know, Randy's done a great job of bringing some technical things up and, um, the county or the city has actually listened a little bit more to the Palisades Neighborhood Association when it comes to the structures and things, you know, do they want covered uh, dugouts? Do they want, you know, fencing areas and those things where a lot of our concern still is. And just so you know, I had a bunch of slides, but I'll tell you that we're still working with um, uh, the trail group that put the Hazelia Agricultural Heritage Trail together to, to actually 
work with some of the advisory boards of Lake Oswego, the sustainability, the um, diversity, equity, and peace, and hopefully we can fold those people into actually working on the sensitive lands area and wildlife because there is no money to actually mitigate any of the things they're doing. So we're working hard about calling out the sustainability group. Uh, HRAB, which is the Historic Resource Advisory Board, has said um, one of their goals is to put these panels into the park. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, um, Randy can answer them. And it, if you think of something, shoot me an email or call me and uh, we'll be more than happy to get answers for you. Thank you, Katie. Good job of getting those up. Next up is uh, John, Gabe, and he's going to do uh, Rich's um, s and uh, conditional use violation, uh, the 2451 uh, Borland Road parking lot violation, uh, the Dollar Street School, and uh, give us some kind of an update on some of the details of the uh, I-205 tolling update, which, which seems to be, there, there's a lot going on um, outside of the engineering and, and uh, uh, a lot of community stuff. So if John could do that, I would appreciate it. Okay, okay well, I'm, I'm slightly out of the loop. Uh, just got back from Europe, uh, took my daughter to Oxford and stayed there just see Europe and um, we came back at the very end of uh, this last month. Um, on the, all I keep on getting emails on is they are working on SNH and the illegal parking lot. They're both on the radar. Uh, they're being reviewed um, because neither of them are conditional use correct. Um, uh, if Rich is here tonight, he would possibly know more than me. Uh, the tolling, um, Randy has sent out stuff. You, you, you sent out stuff that's um, um, very accurate on this. And um, as far as the Dollar Street, if nobody's heard, um, they had a, a huge runoff last week. Uh, and DEQ came in and told them that they had to put tons and tons and tons of rock in there to stop all the slides. And I don't think it's gonna hold uh, and they don't allow us to see the, um, what's been put out by the um, engineers on this. Uh, John, what, I, was that, a, it was just uh, water running off the site? No, it was water, sand and mud. It covered, um, all of Lambert Falls Drive. And so some kind of agreement was made between um, um, DEQ and the, and the contractor. And um, from my house, watching the trucks go by daily, and I was told it's gonna to be for a 10 day period, they're gonna bring, be bringing in this rock because the land isn't holding. The only problem is, is the geotech engineer said the exact same thing would happen. And rather than going, well, I guess we bought a lemon of a piece of land, they just went forward. And it's really scary seeing all the top soil just in piles and it's wearing away daily because of the rain. And I, I just think nothing will be able to be um, restored there uh, for planting. I think it's just going to be a concrete jungle. Uh, how, uh, um, how about their uh, Luba uh, appeal? Did they drop that or are they? No, the appeal was heard and uh, they're supposed to be, um, they're, whatever the judges have decided on it, um, to my knowledge, nothing has been decided yet. But I guess I would like to mention one more thing of an issue at the school district. Uh, their annual audit, which was due 12-31-21, still has not been turned in. 
and they've got gone two months with no uh, Oregon Department of Education funding, and they don't want anybody to know about it. And um, I check that audit each year. The auditors really hate me because each year I bring up errors that they've made and uh, didn't get a chance to do it to the new auditor this year, but they already don't want to come back for next year. Um, but uh, I'm, I was in that field when I uh, did work, I'm retired now. And um, the number of errors I saw were just uncalled for. And, and, and it's really uncalled for that they couldn't get the audit done by September 31st. I have spoken to people, uh, there are deficiencies in the audit and the school district needs to address these deficiencies before there's the audits complete. So it's, it's not all good news. Mm. Uh, on the uh, one thing on the I-205 tolling issue, uh, I, was, I was surprised. I went to the meeting uh, or the video meeting and uh, I was uh, surprised to see that the, the 205 tolling is gonna be for a year. And then it will, is, if this is correct, uh, and then uh, there was some comment that it would be extended to a broader area of uh, I-5 and 205 after that first, yeah. after that initial year. Do you know anything about that? Okay, what I do know is I went through a earlier meeting and um, whatever ODOT comes up with, still has to go through uh, Department of Transportation. And already, at least um, Senator Wyden has said, that's not gonna happen. In other words, he does not accept uh, the way they wanna do the tolling. And so um, it's basically like the last meeting I was in in December, they're trying to throw this whole thing to uh, Metro because ODOT, I think there's so much, um, they're trying to get the numbers correct, but like when they say there'll be so much uh, easier to flow traffic on 205 when they get in the additional lane, and I'm like, yeah, because nobody's going to want to pay, and they're going to be on. This, they're going to be coming through our neighborhood. Basically. Um, okay, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mitch, is there? Uh, did you have anything else, John? Uh, no. Okay, Mitch. Is there anything new happening? Nothing from my standpoint, uh, Randy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yep. thanks, Mitch. And then Len, anything? No. Anything new happening? No. Okay. Uh, and then um, there's the the only thing I really have. We looks like we have some additional time here. Uh, Len, are you are you going to say something? I just uh, wanted to mention that uh, nothing to report from the uh, CPO summit. However, most of the things that do come up there are uh, a lot more severe, I guess you call reactions to land use than what we ever see because we're not in the in the genre that the, those guys are. So I kind of just sit there and watch things go back and forth. But when things come up, uh, I'll give a report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then on the... Um, uh, the retaining walls on the river at the two houses on Child's Road, that, that uh, was the, that retaining wall and the erosion control and all of that was approved by the county. So they're, uh, they're open to go through with that. And then um, the, on the sunny, uh, I have a few minutes. So on the sunny slope um, uh, mountain bike trail, um, the neighbors are talking about uh, opening. There's the parks department has um, announced that there would be a quiet, quiet opening. We we haven't had any notice, but there'd be a quiet opening of the. Uh, park BMX trails. They've got all the, they've got trails all the way through the park, and uh, there was no public process for the uh, trail development. And we're we're just sort of uh, I, I think it's it's 
it's just that the trails are complete. They've got signage up uh, and uh, uh, they're going to do it. Uh, the um, Rick? Oh, no, Rick's just good. Um, and then uh, I, if Katie's on, I sent her a, an email uh, for to actually, we'll probably discuss it next month. I don't know, maybe it'll be this month, but on uh, uh, a way to uh, get recordings of the CPO meetings or minutes in, or a way to get the uh, minutes and, and uh, instructions for how we deliver it to the uh, our CPO minutes or recordings to the county. And so we're, we're just, and particularly after the, uh, we switch to meeting, uh, you know, meeting in person again. And there's some other elements to that, but that we're gonna talk about that later, I think. Uh, so those are the, those are the only things. As far as Carol's sign goes, the, the uh, children's uh, pollinator sign goes. The, the sign is apparently almost done production wise. It's, it's being fused to a sheet of aluminum and they've got the base, I guess. And uh, the parks department is gonna install, you see it up at Lusher Farm sometime soon. So. <laughs> That's about it. It looks cool. So, you know, it should be fun. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, on to the next thing, which is Bill. Thanks, Randy. Um, well done, all of you. I, I, I hope the community realizes that um, with all the all the issues that come across um, the CPO's um, collective desk. Um, you folks really do a good job of not only staying on top of things, but also um, giving us a voice and giving the community uh, the opportunity to have a voice uh, in, in, in what's happening. I, um, I, I, I don't know how we did this. Um, <laughs> and when we were at such minimal um, numbers of folks being involved, but uh, it's great to have all of you. So thanks, thanks very much. Um, so having said that, um, I think we're at a place where we can move on to the uh, to the board meeting, uh, and we're actually uh, a little ahead of schedule, and um, the CPO board can take full and complete credit for that. So thank you. Um, so, uh, I, you know, before we start, I, I'm going to bridge this just a little bit. You've mentioned um, minutes with, um, uh, particularly if we go back to in-person meetings or partial and, you know, some in-person and some Zoom. Um, I haven't talked to Kate Roth about this, but... Um, Maybe that's a conversation that, that uh, Randy and, uh, and she and I can have uh, in so far as, as getting some kind of budgetary support to, to have her take um, minutes as well for, this, for the CPO. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that, that transpire there that um, it's pretty incumbent to have the details right. So anyway, um, now, now we'll move on to the board meeting. Um, so calling to order, um, we've got an agenda, which hopefully all of you have had a chance to um, peruse. And, and I should say that the point of having us approve the agenda, I mean, it does, particularly the way I handle it, seem like a formality. But if there are things you want to add to the agenda, don't hesitate to bring those to the dance. Um, I mean, you can also do that before we ever get here. Um, but um, anyway, so given that everybody's had a chance to see the agenda for the last um, week and change, um, if there are no additional
additions or subtractions. Um, and I'm assuming that that's the case, but that may not be. But if there aren't, then can I get somebody to make a motion to approve the agenda as written? Motion to approve. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, second. And I got a hand raised from Bill Wong. Thanks Thank so you. much, Bill. <laughs> and Andy, okay. Uh, so all those uh, that uh, choose to raise their hands and approving the, uh, the agenda, um, and all those that are totally um, against the agenda as written. Very good. Uh, and and we got uh, we got Lynn um, beeping us here on his phone. So well well played, Lynn. Hi. I should also note, uh, and maybe I said this before. I'm not sure, but we do not have uh, Rich Fiala. Uh, I don't think we've got Sally uh, Decipio, and we do not have Patty Manuela. And they had all reached out to say that the likelihood was that they wouldn't make it. So um, that's how that played out. Um, you also got the minutes um, about a week ago from Kate Roth, and uh, I, as whenever I read through those, I'm always amazed at, um, that it's been a whole month since we did what we did, but uh, well done, and I didn't see anything there that needed to be added from the last meeting, um, but if you, any of you did, then this is the time to say something, and if not, um, can I get a motion to approve the minutes as written? Motion to approve the minutes as written. Thanks, Andy. And a second? Second. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, all those um, willing to raise your hand and approve the minutes? And that's everybody except for Tate, because Tate's, um, Tate's very stoic. Um, and uh, anybody against this? The uh, the minutes as being approved. Oh, <laughs> no, not now, not now, Tate. I was kidding, ma'am. Oh, okay. Well, Tate definitely is not a fan of the minutes, so uh, we'll we'll take his uh, we'll take his changes in writing. Uh, Treasurer's report, Bill Long. Got to mute you. Unmute yourself, bud. There you yeah. Go. Um, it came out late because I was hoping to get a statement from the bank. The county couldn't come through, and um, we have a brand new mailbox over in West Lynn, but there was no mail. So what you got is our checkbook, which is accurate. It would have been nice to reconcile it, but. Maybe we'll have mail next month. Do you want me to talk about the pumpkin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talk about the pumpkin. pumpkin. Okay. Well, I was talking to Rich. Um, based on if you throw a golf ball at your neighbor's house or a couple of them and ask them, what's the hammock and what's the mission and who are they? Nobody really knows. I really believe that. And one of the ways I thought, Rich and I were tossing around ideas, and I was thinking, how about some Hamlet pumpkins? Uh, my son can give me eight inch nursery stakes, plastic, sequentially numbered, and we could have those available, put notes in schools, and parents accompany their kids over to Rich's farm, and they get some pumpkin seeds uh, to go plant and number and register their name. Then they get back, come back, they can bring their parents back and watch it grow, or they can harvest it at a discount. And it's a perfect opportunity to get the parents aware of our mission. And you know darn well if kids are involved, we may only get 50 the first year, but I swear we'd get 150 the next year. Um, and I just thought um, it's an opportunity to get our message out to people who don't know or care what the Hamlet is or what we want to do. The kids will bring them down to harvest their, their pumpkin. Anyway, that's my idea. 
Uh, and and didn't you didn't you say that that Rich was uh, was supportive of this? Yeah, he was. Okay. Because you mean, know it brings people back to his farm. No, no. But it yeah. would also I bring mean, a lot of new people. By the same token, if we want Rich to be um, in the affirmative, given that it is his place that we're going to be putting seeds and having people come back and get their pumpkins at a later date. So no, that's great. Um, well, uh, it sounds like there's. Uh, 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 and I don't know. I don't know when you plant pumpkins. I would assume it's you know closer to April or June. But um, anyway, um, that's great, Bill. I see no reason why that that wouldn't wouldn't benefit everybody. Uh, the other thing that is under Bill's um, heading, but it's been something I've been working on, and I think you guys all got a revised copy today of the uh, the budget. Um, if there's anything that anybody wants to throw at this or take out of this that they don't think it's uh, it, it's worthy, um, have at it. The, the county was pretty specific this year, just like they were last year, that they didn't want to put more than $2,000 into anybody's coffers. Um, as you saw with the revisions, I missed a couple of things. Um, and and in, in turn, the... the the piece of, of having Kate um, help with the CPO also added a little bit. Um, we're up to a little over $3,000. And the way this sits right now is I'm going to sit with the other two Hamlet chairs uh, and some folks from the county uh, sometime, I believe, next week. And we're going to try and, uh, and come up with utilizing some of their money that they're not going to need this year um, and, and put it in our, our coffers. So we'll see how that goes. But there's still a good chance, as far as I can tell, that uh, we may get, uh, may get what we are asking for. Um, and again, I'm open to input from you guys, as always, if you see something there that, that needs to be worked on. So thank you. Um, okay, we're on to committee reports, um, which <clears throat> Andy gets to, uh, to add anything that he didn't say, um, both in terms of mapping and in terms of the, the cedar saplings. Um, communication would be the mapping and, and the ag part would be the fur and cedar saplings. Anything you wanted to add, Andy, that came into your brain after you did what you did? Nope. Um, earlier? No, I, I, I think that we've got a, a pretty stellar plan going forward. Let's see how it shakes out over the next coming weeks. Um, I'll report back whether I get some emails and uh, some trees to disappear out of that cooler down there. Great. Well, and thanks for uh, to to uh, to Kelsey for coming down and, and being part of the videotaping and uh, tape um, and being there for um, um, taking in information too. And you and Andy, it sounds like you're going to put some kind of a video together that will help people know how to how to where and how to plant these um, the most effectively. Um, Rich is. Ill, I don't know that he did anything specific to agriculture. In fact, I think it was mostly um, the trees this last month. So um, I'm supposed to give another CCB report on um, either the 21st or the 17th. I'm not quite sure which, um, but uh, our, our uh, our contemporary over at Beaver Creek, Tammy Stevens did hers last Thursday and did a great job. Um, she hadn't been in front of them for a number of months, just like I hadn't until I did, did ours last February or last month. Um, so um, we'll give them a, a little summary of what's happened in the last month and, and we'll go from there. Uh, Rick, uh, we got C4, um, do you want to give us any updates there? Yeah, just real quick, uh, Kenny Cernak, who is a board member of Beaver Creek, is now the Hamlet's 
representative on C4, which is the Clackamas County Coordinating Committee, which is all the mayors, special districts. Uh, we get meet once a month to talk <clears throat> supposedly transportation and, and housing and stuff. So um, he's taking over John Key's spot, which I kind of covered while John moved out of state. So, um, and the uh, alternative is, I believe his name is David Knight, and I could be wrong on that, from Malino. So uh, basically Stafford is off the hook for four years. Um, after two years, they just rotate everybody through. And so this David guy would become the next uh, Hamlet rep. And then Stafford Hamlet would have to put somebody in as the alternate and work up the chain to that. And that's just been the way we've rotated through. Um, and the CPO um, rep is still uh, Martin Myers <coughs> from Redlands and he's on the executive boards and he's real good. Um, so that's the C4 thing. Um, CCI, the only thing we got going there is that we have uh, three spots open and we have four applicants to come on board with that. So things are going well there and that's it from outside the borders. Great, thanks a lot. Um, any other concerns that anybody has that we need to address? Um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I guess the only thing that I have, and I just need to put together uh, a, an evening or an afternoon that we can all kind of sit down and, and reconnoiter about the family fest. Um, I've had feedback um, from a number of folks that they're very interested in being involved and a few that, that are not. Um, but I think if we can engage Carolyn Comer, who is here tonight, um, to help us um, recruit some of the youth to help with um, both the kids and, and the parking piece, um, that would be fantastic. Um, so maybe, maybe, we can, uh, maybe we can hook up uh, Caroline and, uh, and let us know how your, your schedule looks and, uh, and what you think is possible. And that goes for the community that's still listening in at this point, um, which actually is quite a few. Um, if you have any interest in helping us put this thing together, we've been out of it for two years. Um, we, uh, we hope that we're not being naive and thinking that COVID is in fact uh, under control and is gonna wait until we pull this off, which will be the second Saturday in September, and I want to say it's, I think it was the 10th. Um, if, if, we can, if we can get enough folks put together, this, this shouldn't be too tough because we've got definitely some, some history here. But anyway, that being said, uh, anybody else have anything? Up, up, there's a waving hand and it is Rick Cook. Rick Cook, unmute yourself, buddy. Thanks to any students from Beaver Creek to correct me again that uh, the alternate is Derek from Milano. But the other piece is there is going to be a skate park initial meeting that is going to be April 2nd. And I'll get that information uh, to Katie or whomever. We can post that on the board. I just forgot to mention that earlier. And I looked at my notes and saw that. So the skate park, um, $800,000 going in the northwest corner. And there's lots of us that think that that's going to attract lots of uh, traffic. So anyway, thank you. Thank um, you. It looks like John McCabe has his hand up. Did you have a question, John? Hmm. John? <laughs> there, we there he go. is. Oh. Here, here I am. Um, essentially, uh, when we brought up about like playing replanting trees like Christmas trees from Weyerhaeuser. Uh, I don't know if anybody, I don't, obviously I was not at the last two meetings, but Weyerhaeuser has absolutely no trees this year. Uh, the minimum order they'll take is 5,000. Uh, there was no public sale. And I don't think we have any number of people to get 5,000 because this is about the last week when you need to plant for the year. And um, uh, there's going to be a shortage of Christmas trees in about six years. I mean, people were trying to do it to people this year saying, oh, there's a shortage. There wasn't this year. Six years from now, good luck finding a tree. And on the pumpkins, it's plant in June. And depending on our, if we have 
a summer like we had last year, they'll be ready by September. If we have an overcast summer, they'll be ready by October. Great. I, I keep forgetting you've got the family farm. Thanks a lot, John. Right. And oh, and just, just on that note real quick, I, um, our guy at OSU, he was able to get us trees pretty quick. Um, so I don't know to what end they're going to have trees. Um, but he did articulate that we need to get them in the ground like this month. Um, but it did make me think if people can't get them in the ground, uh, if you have like an old sand spot where your kids played um, in the sand, you can dump the trees in there and they'll start to put their roots down in there. And then you can easily pluck them back out and plant them when it's a better time of year. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, John. Anybody else? Okay. Well, hearing nothing, um, I'm going to um, move that we adjourn and, uh, and we try this again uh, next month on April the 12th. Hope to see you all back there. Thanks, everybody, for showing up and, and being involved with our, our Hamlet. All right. Thanks, Katie Kreider. Good night, night guys. Bill. Night, John boy.